This episode is sponsored by Mantis Sleep. Mantis Sleep makes sleep masks and sleep accessories that help you get the energy to create your best life. Head to the link in the description to get 10% off. Why are there dolphins in the Amazon and why do they look like that. We're talking pink, really long nose, low dorsal fin, weirdly flexible neck, not quite like the classic bottlenose we're used to. And it's not just the Amazon. There are actually a handful of river dolphin species around the world, and they all share some combination of these very unique attributes to the point where they were once considered to be their own evolutionary group. But they're not. They're a bunch of unrelated, but nonetheless very similar looking dolphins. So where did they all come from? And what is it about living in rivers that causes dolphins to look so specific? The Bizarre Beast Pin Club is open for subscriptions for the whole month. Sign up by April 20th, and the first pin you'll get will be a river dolphin. There are varying answers to the question of how many river dolphin species there currently are in the world. That's largely thanks to the fact that river dolphin is just an informal descriptive grouping, not an official classification. For our purposes, we're using it to mean dolphins that live exclusively in rivers and freshwater, as opposed to the ocean. Based on that, true river dolphins belong to three different families on two different continents, plus a couple of exceptions that we'll get to. The Amazon River Dolphin that we know and love, Inia jeffersensis, also known as the Boto, belongs in the family Inaeidae. Depending on who you ask, this family includes between one and four total species, including the Amazon River Dolphin's Bolivian cousin, called the Bufeo. Way on the other side of the globe, you'll find the family Platanistidae, which includes the Ganges River Dolphin and the Indus River Dolphin, Platanista gangetica and Platanista minor, respectively. And lastly, a few thousand miles northeast of those two, you'll find Lepotidae, with its one modern species, Lepotes felixifer, the Yangtze's river dolphin, also called the Baiji. Or rather, you would have found it until the early 2000s. Sadly, human activity has caused their very likely total extinction. But we know from back when the Baiji was still around, and from observing all the South Asian and South American species today, is that these dolphins all share some key characteristics. One of those is their color, at least to some extent. Marine Green dolphins come in a variety of not only colors, but patterns, whereas all river dolphins have a tendency towards more drab palettes. Instead of any of the cool stripes and whatnot sported by some ocean species, river dolphins are largely brownish gray, often with varying degrees of pink. And even the more exciting instances of that type of pink, like in the Amazonian dolphins that show it off the most, it's actually due to lack of pigment. The color comes from blood vessels in the skin that dilate in warmer water. Waters. In cooler temperatures, Amazon river dolphins just look white, and they start their lives as gray. Adult males are usually the pinkest, partially because the gray goes away with age, but partially because fighting males scar each other, and the scar tissue also lacks the original gray pigment. For dolphins in general, solid colors or minimal patterns are associated with spending a lot of time in low visibility waters, among other factors. So this tracks as a logical adaptation for these species who live in murky rivers. There's also a theory that the Boto's pinkification might be a way to signal maturity to prospective mates. Whatever the reason for their colors, the outcome is a clear difference from their seafaring counterparts. Something else that these distinct families of river dwellers also share is some version of a stylish, long nose, big forehead, little eyes look. Research into cetacean skull morphology has shown that diet is the biggest factor determining face shape for whales and dolphins. A longer snout with Lots of teeth is ideal for catching small, fast prey like fish, and river dolphins are some of the most specialized in that department. As for the head and eyes, they have more to do with the turbid waters where the dolphins catch all those fish. Vision alone isn't enough to hunt or navigate through so much silt, so river dolphins are extra reliant on echolocation. The Ganges and Indus River species have even leaned so hard on this tool that they're basically blind. All dolphins are toothed whales. And and the fatty structure on the front of a toothed whale's head is called a melon, and it's instrumental to their echolocation. This melon, in contrast with the extra long nose in front of it, is what gives the river dolphins such a prominent forehead. Echolocation studies on the Boto have also shown that the specific physical and acoustic obstacles of living in rivers and flooded forests require them to use different frequencies and techniques than their marine counterparts. Add to this a low dorsal fin, big pectoral fins, and a super flexible 
flexible neck, and you'll end up with an exceptionally maneuverable dolphin that's perfectly suited to its environment. In other words, if you were to come up behind a river dolphin and ask, why the long face? It could quickly whip around to reply, jump. All right, so these guys look the way they do for understandable adaptive reasons. But how do we know that they didn't just inherit these traits from a common ancestor? As is a running theme on the show, these different species' unique visual similarities can be chalked up to convergent evolution. They live in very distant parts of the world, after all, without similar-looking species bridging the spaces between them. How would this happen? Well, the most likely explanation for their whole deal is that their ancestors took a series of independent ventures into shallow seas about 11.6 to 16 million years ago, eventually leaving them riverbound when the sea levels went back down. And we could just take the word of folks who diligently measured a bunch of river dolphin and outgroup skulls and then geometrically calculated that, yep, they're convergent. But thankfully, we also have other clues to back up this story. Fossil and genetic evidence point to multiple multiple separate instances of marine dolphins making their way into what are now inland South America, eastern China, and eastern and western India and Pakistan. Then, once they got trapped, they speciated and specialized. We also know that worldwide, dolphin species living on the coast and in estuaries and rivers tend to have more flexible spines than their fast-swimming pelagic cousins. So at least some of the adaptive groundwork was already in place for the river dolphins to be. Interestingly, species like the Baiji and the Boto, despite being found on totally different continents, seem to be significantly more closely related to each other than the Baiji was to its more nearby southwest neighbors. Lepodidae and Aniidae share a common ancestor about 15 million years ago. While you'd have to go back roughly 23 million years to find a common ancestor with Platanistidae. But this is consistent with the theory of totally separate instances of unrelated ancestors making their way into river systems from the open ocean. More recent discoveries do kind of throw a wrench into this theory, though, like the fossil found in Panama, which seems to indicate an ancient river dolphin lived at sea. The age of the fossil doesn't rule out the possibility that this species branched out from the same ancestor as modern Aniidae, with one group moving back out to sea and going extinct, while the others stayed in the rivers and stuck around. So the classic river dolphin traits we've discussed could have evolved before the Panamanian species left the river but it's tough to be certain. As the authors of one study put it, the classification history of extinct cetaceans is long and bewildering. There is modern precedence for dolphins evolving into river form and then heading back for saltwater. The Franciscana, Pontoporia blainvillii, which lives in the estuaries and coastal waters of eastern South America. The family tree puts them closest to the boto, and they sure look like river dolphins, but freshwater life seems to be an ancestral state they've left behind. On the flip flip side of that coin, there's the Takushi, Sotalia fluviatilis, a member of the marine dolphin family that has moved into the same rivers as the Bota. It appears to have split off from its sister species, S. Gienensis, making it the first known delphinid to live exclusively in freshwater. And this split is recent enough that the Takushi doesn't yet have any obvious river adaptations, aside from maybe some incidental pink here and there. Even more evolutionarily exciting is the Yangtze finless porpoise, Neophocina Asi orientalis. This species seems to have split off from a nearby porpoise population only 5,000 to 100,000 years ago. They've made their way far enough inland to become freshwater exclusive and to totally cut off gene flow with the marine group. And just for fun, the Yangtze finless porpoise has unfused neck vertebrae for a very flexible reach, just like every river dolphin species. All this is to say that dolphins and their relatives have independently been trying out the river lifestyle on and off for millions of years. And they're going to keep it up, too. River ecosystems lead to some cool adaptations, but they're also much more sensitive to changes caused by humans, so today's beasts are especially vulnerable. Habitat fragmentation due to dam construction, bycatch in fishing nets, and pollution of all kinds pose serious threats to every one of these species. And because they're so rare, it's that much more important for us to take proactive steps to protect them before they all go the way of the Baiji. As for the dolphins' physical appearances, river life just seems to favor this kind of body plan. Maybe in millions of years, the descendants of the Takushi and the Yangtze finless porpoise will start to follow the same adaptive path of their same niche distant relatives. If so, I doubt they'd find any of these helpful physical features to be the least bit bizarre. 
Sign up for the pin club at bizarrebeshow.com to help us keep this channel going. If you want a river dolphin to be your first pin, sign up by April 20th. And you might notice that I have a river dolphin shirt. You can also get these right now at bizarrebeshow.com. And now for some bonus facts. Convergent evolution of key traits for life in rivers isn't limited to dolphins. This exact same type of specialization is seen in a totally different group of aquatic predators with similar head shapes crocodiles. One research team measured the skulls of 22 species of crocodilians, plus the skulls of 54 species of toothed whales, and looked for correlations between skull shape, prey, and habitat. These skulls represented 72% of extant toothed whale species and 92% of extant crocodilians, so a pretty thorough sample of what's out there. The researchers found that the range of skull shapes within each taxonomic group showed more variation than between groups. They also found that the real standouts for skull length were river dolphins on the cetacean side and gharials on the crocodilian side. Studies focused only on toothed whales have concluded that prey type is the main determiner of skull shape. Suction feeders have shorter faces than species adapted for grabbing prey, and species that catch small prey have longer faces than those who catch large prey. This helps explain why marine dolphins have longer noses than other toothed whales, as well as why river dolphins have longer noses than and marine dolphins. The crocodile factor adds to our understanding of the convergent evolution in river dolphin species by concluding that very distantly related predator species that live in rivers and mainly eat small fish all have the longest snout compared to any of their closer relatives. So for river predators like dolphins and gharials, looking like that may literally come with the territory after enough evolutionary time. While the tiny eyes of river dolphins mean they probably don't need help shutting out the visual distractions of the world, for you and I, it's a different story. And that's where Mantis Sleep comes in. Mantis Sleep makes the world's best sleep masks and functional sleep accessories to enable better lives through better sleep and regular naps. Like their Mantis Sound Sleep Mask, for example, the most comfortable Bluetooth sleep mask around. It's highly adjustable and features both razor-thin headphones and a 20-hour battery life, twice as long as the leading competition. All while providing true 100% blackout with zero eye pressure, helping you get the naps you need to give you the energy, focus, strength, and clarity that you don't get when you grind through the afternoon. Head to the link in our description and use the code BizarreBeasts to get 10% off your order.